Let me get right. Yeah. All right. You ready? Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> Three, two, one. All right. So a lot happening in the world right now. And I listened to somebody on social media. They said, hey, I started calling my teammates and it struck me. So I wanted to call one of my old teammates, Lou Saka Polite. You got an incredible introduction, Lou, that I will totally talk about. Bears, Cowboys, Patriots, Dolphins, Falcons, four-year starter at Pitt, the only three-time captain at Pitt. Uh, I'm so lucky that you were my teammate, one of my closest friends, and now we've reconnected. Thanks for coming on my podcast, man. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate this. I'm, I'm super excited right now. I know. Like, I, I don't know what it is. I'd be curious your take, because you, you, you thrived in high school, Woody High, thrived in college, as I just referenced, thrived in the NFL. Where do your, your best relationships come from? Like, which era of football? Or, or are they all totally different for you? I think they all were super important to me and they all serve a different purpose um but ultimately they all taught me the one the one important life lesson i think everyone should take with them is relationships are extremely important and no matter what phase of life you're in it's really important to connect and kind of get uh hunkered down with somebody that you can relate to and can have your back in that moment so as a peewee football player you know some my, my neighborhood kids and they they were important to me because I wasn't born here. I was born in South Carolina and I moved to Pittsburgh um, when I was seven years old. So uh, the first thing my parents thought I should do was get involved with sports. So naturally uh, hit and learning to fit in with the neighborhood kids was really important. And that's, so they were important for me in that phase. Then the next phase in you know, high school, um, just kind of getting connected to the guys that had the same mission, the same mindset, trying to go to college and trying to get a scholarship. So I made sure I connected with those type of guys and, we were working out together and, you know, starting to get that grown man body and feeling good about it. And the letters start coming in. So they serve a different purpose uh, than my college friends, my lifelong friends. You're one of them. Um, just talking about manhood and what's what to expect and, and, and what it's going to look like down the road with, with wives and kids now that we both have. So it's like, I mean, you can't write a better story, man. So I feel like everybody in your life, um, they serve a purpose. Uh, and hopefully they can all remain in your life for as long as possible. But we know how life life takes you different places and it doesn't always work out that way. But I've been lucky enough to have friends from every single phase that I just talked about still in my life, you know, that were at my wedding and were, you know, I still talk to you daily. You know, I wish you could have been at my wedding. Um, but, you know, I'm going to stop blabbing right now because, you know, I'll get on my soapbox and I'll, I'll go forever. You know that about me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be quiet now. I don't know how long this this segment lasts, so I'll be quiet. Oh, we got about forty minutes, man. Um, oh, okay, let's go. Yeah, right. yeah, let's roll. Let's roll. I I just think it's like I just went back to Pittsburgh. It's where we bumped into each other. We we're at the Peterson Event Center watching a basketball game, and I watched. No offense to the basketball team, but maybe three total minutes because it was you, it was Penny, it was Chevy Troutman, my friend Jason was there. You know, it was EJ, like Celeste, like all of our people kind of were a part of you know, that two hour window of a basketball game, got to just connect them, which old teammates, right? I mean, how many guys, Chad Reed, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And as I was flying home the next morning, I sat there and I was like, man, like these guys, you, you all played such a critical role in my life, you know? And I think to my parents, I'd be curious if, if you feel the same way. And whenever I see Chris Wilson out here in LA, we always rec you know, reminisce on our parents miss it maybe even more than we do because yes. of the relationships that they all had going to pick games. But for me, I was like, man, like what you did and what so many of our teammates did to me in that life, 18 to 22, to give direction, to support, you know, you thinking back, like it was the biggest deal in the world to try, at least for me to get a scholarship or for you to be a three-time captain, four-year starter. Looking back, like it's, it's, there's clearly bigger things in the world, but the relationships along the way kind of breathed life into my dreams. And, and you're one of those guys. And I was like, man, like, I just want to hang out with them. You know, and I think like this Corona thing, like, which is huge, is forcing us to pause. And I'm trying to like reach out to old teammates because I think to your point, we, we get on this fast track of life the minute college ends. And we, you know, I can't ever get back for a spring game because I'm calling games. I never get back for homecoming because I'm calling games. So I never see anybody. And I, it, it just, it struck me very deeply the next morning of like, 
damn, like Lou, Larry, AB. I mean, I, we go down the list of guys, like you just had such a profound influence on the trajectory of my life. And I, I, felt, I, I don't know if I ever told you that. No, I appreciate that, man. I, I really do. And I, I felt that. I, I agree, man. I barely watched that last basketball game as well. And um, I don't know if I told you when I saw you, but I, I just ran into Larry um, in New York because I wanted to go support him for his uh, – Jefferson Award uh, he was being inducted to. So, um, and we talked about that, man, just missing those those moments uh, when we were just trying to figure it out, you know what I mean? And we, we've we committed to each other to just like we did, you and I, to make time, whether it's a text, you know, five minute, like we'll figure it out monthly, man, just to make sure we stay connected because it's really important to me and I'm sure it is to you and all of our teammates that we take a pause and, and really, uh, remember that. I mean, I think, like you said, man, the coronavirus is, is an indication to me on my on my spiritual side, an indicator that uh, somebody is telling us it's time to take a pause and remember what's really important here. So, um, unfortunately, there's a lot of casualties. I mean, that's that's it's been sad, but ultimately, I'm telling you, I feel like it's a message from a higher power that's telling us, "Come on now, let's 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 rally up the troops and focus on what's really important." Yeah. Okay, so let, let's let's reflect a little bit because it's kind of fun, and that's like a fancy word for let's just like talk about the old times. Um, okay, I look back at our team, you, Chris Wilson, Antonio Bryant, Larry when he was there, Rod. I mean, you can go to like Dave Priestley, like the, Gerald. Like, there's so much talent, and I would love nothing more now as an analyst to go back and like watch practice tape or game tape and like really analyze us. Because when I look back at that, at those teams, right, I think of all the wideouts, all the backs, all the DBs, Sean Takes, so many guys kicked out to the league. Um, I feel as though, like when I match it up against the teams I study every day in the Pac-12, like our team was like a top 10, 15 team. Like, like we literally should have been you – know, we, we made nice little runs, but I look back and I'm like, man, I, I don't think that we maximize our potential. Do you, do you think that that's just like us living in the moment and thinking we're sweeter than we are? Or do you think when you look at the roster and now looking at rosters, you're like, no, that team was loaded? No, knowing, knowing what we know now, uh, just with both of our backgrounds and your current profession, you're, you're spot on, man. I, I think about that constantly. Even when, when I'm not working at Pitt and watching a football team, I'm like, man, we can get after a lot of these guys. <laughs> like the guys that we had, we were freaking loaded. But to that point, man, I, um, I, I got to use one of the quotes um, from the greatest, one of my favorite coaches I ever had, Bill Parcells. He was like, you know, when it comes to building a roster on a pro team, it's not always about having the best 53, but the right 53. Yeah. And I think that has to be the only thing I can think of because we had a ton of talent. Uh, maybe we got in our own way. I mean, we definitely let some, someone, some games get away from us that we shouldn't have, like when we were ranked top 10. And we lose to freaking Toledo the next week. Like, like moments like that, like, you wish you can get those back because knowing what we know now, we didn't have our, our expectations weren't as high as they, sh they should have been. I think individually, you know what I mean? I feel like there was more meat on the bone that, that was there to, to be had than we just didn't, uh, for whatever reason, we just didn't, didn't get it, man. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. So I want to lean into that a little bit because your role now is amazing. You're the assistant AD of the Varsity Letter Club and mentorship. I feel like I know what an element of that is, but could you describe what, what it is that you're doing right now? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, my role, my two of my roles are housed under this umbrella of the Kathy and John Pelosi Family Life Skills Program. Um, it's been going strong for 20 years now. Uh, Penny Samaya has been the leader of this this amazing department, which is the best in the country. I'm not just saying that. Um, the one number that we lay our hat on is that we have a 100% replacement rate of our student athletes from six months of graduating. So, I mean, that in itself proves why we're the best. And we're the largest. Uh, we have 10 people full-time dedicated to the student athlete development piece. Um, most universities just don't have the, the resources or the ability to dedicate um, that many people to that field. So there's a lot of people that wear multiple hats, like uh, academic support uh, staff may, you know, put on their life skills half for half a day and maybe work with some resumes and interview skills. But no, we have people dedicated to that all the time. So we have a career counselor, 
we have, I mean, just multiple people. We break it down into five key commitment areas, um, just graduate school prep, community service, financial literacy, um, the alumni engagement, which is uh, what I head up, myself, John Pelusi Jr., and uh, Sam Clancy. And then the mentorship piece is where we connect everything. So I already work with the alumni, so I'm connecting them with the current student athletes as the mentor program so that now when they graduate, they already have a built-in program, built-in network. They already kind of got a, a, a leg up on everyone because now they've been able to do a, a, a shadow or a site visit or just get to figure out, is this the career I want to be in? Because we, ba we pair them based on the career they're, they're looking to pursue. So now they can find out if they really want to do that before it's too late. You know what I mean? So um, our motto is we meet them where they are, find out where you want to go, and we're going to build a plan to get there. Uh, we have 500 student athletes, so we have 500 plans. This is not a cookie, this is not a cookie cutter approach, bro. This is we we really tailor it to every single student athlete and their needs because we want to be there uh, from the day they the moment we meet them until to the twilight of the days. And that's I just took a penny quote, but um, that's what he, that's what we preach to our, our recruits, the parents when they come in and they love it. They love the fact that there's something separate from the sport and the academics piece. There's something totally for the student athlete. And that is that everything that embodies being a student athlete. So that life skills piece is very underestimated, but it's starting to pick up across the country and more schools are starting to pay attention. So I'm happy to be a part of the, um, the, the cutting edge portion of the, you know, the, 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 the school is already ahead of it. And I'm proud that it's my school. Yeah. And it's your school. That's the coolest part, you know what I mean? So that's what I do, man. I love that. I, one of my favorite phrases is, uh, you said, meet them where their feet are. One of my favorite phrases I wear at t-shirts is be where your feet are, right? So like literally, and you're, you're as good as anybody as I've ever seen at that. And then the other one is when you're working with somebody is to meet them where they sweat, right? Yeah. So like wh where, where are you sweating? Like if you, if you work out all the time, let's go work out. And that's where we'll have our conversation. You know, yep. if you're a, a bookworm, let's go meet at the library. Let's go to a book festival, like whatever it is, meet somebody where they sweat. So the dialogue can begin around the passions of athletes. I do this exercise that I, I learned. I don't know if you were in the class with me, but it was with a guy named Dr. Lloyd Corder, who was at Pitt. And he's one of the only a few professors I, I recall. No offense to any of them, but he was amazing. <laughs> That's how it is sometimes. Right? Yeah. And he had me do an assignment, which I have guys who retire from the league. I have them all do it. Um, or guys that finish college. And I have them write down, I asked them to write down 50 things I want to do in life. And it could be anything. And my list was pathetic and decent. It was like, be a lawyer, get a scholarship, meet Jerry Rice, date Paris Hilton, like across the board. I've never been a lawyer, but I got a scholarship. I interviewed Jerry Rice two years ago and uh, I never, you know, whatever, never dated Paris Hilton, obviously, which is probably a good thing for my life right now. Uh, but with all that being said, I, I think uh, if I wasn't prompted to do that, um, I wouldn't have had a little guidebook. I still have my list of 50, right? Um, I, I say that on the heels of, you reference Bill Belichick. You've been around some of the greats in your professional career. Bill Belichick, uh, Parcells, Lovey Smith, Mike Smith. Uh, just kind of curious for you, because you can go on each one, I'm sure, for hours. But what did you pull? You know, you referenced Parcells about building a roster, but to pull towards, the, you know, you as a dad, you as a husband, you as a teammate, you as a mentor now for – you know, young athletes in Gen Z, which is a totally different world than we were when we were in 15, 20 years ago. I think um, the, the one thing I pulled from, from that experience with those, those caliber of people was just, just to find out how things work and then work them. Uh, when I got to the league, you know, I, I came in through the back door. It wasn't drafted. You know, there was a lot of high expectations initially, you know, how to, their high rankings and a great combine, whatever that means. Um, but at the end of the day, I wasn't drafted on that, on that, that weekend. And, you know, I had to find another way to pursue that dream because that being getting to the league was probably one of those things on that 50 list that you're talking about that I would have added to my list. Um, so, um, being able to still get there and, and learning how to adjust, learning how to not make things personal. I don't, I don't like saying that we're taking personal, you make them personal, right? 
So I learned how to not make them personal and just figure it out, man, and adjust and, and, and re realize that um, it could always be worse, right? If you, ever, if you have a chance, I mean, that's all you can ask for in life. And I, and I really took that to heart. Um, and I, I don't know if it's just a fullback thing, a mentality thing, but um, just that blue collar mindset that I, that I learned uh, growing up in, in North Braddock, you know what I mean? It's, it's rough over there, man. It's, it's still bad, you know? Um, but I, I took all those things with me throughout my journey through any uh, influential coach, even Coach Harris, you know, um, love the process. I got to show you. Now I'm going to pick up my iPad because this is not scripted. But we're going to yes. walk over. We're going to walk over. And one of the things you're going to see here on my wall is what? Wow. Love the process. Love the process. Right. So. As much as we hated to hear that, that's one of the realest statements I ever heard, man. Totally. What right? So, yeah, go ahead. Listen. No, I mean, just speaking of Coach Harris, like, I, I'd be curious how you would describe your relationship with him. Uh, I'm going to try to get him on here because I think it's, it's fun to catch up. He and I, I don't know if he would see it this way, but I, I can remember this like yesterday. I walked into Pitt thinking I sh should have had a scholarship. Clearly, he didn't. Right. Nobody else agreed with that, but they, they gave me a chance and right. played as a freshman and played as a sophomore. And I remember after twice a year, after every season and after every spring ball, I'd schedule a meeting with Walt, Coach Harris. He would, he would gracefully take it. And I walk in there and I can't imagine being a head coach and having a kid do this. But I walked in there like kind of guns blazing, like, I think I have earned a scholarship. And he basically said, oh, I think you haven't, you know, like not yet, not yet, not yet. And then finally, um, my third year there, he said, yeah, it was time to do it. But what I found is that in our moments where we would talk, I felt as though he really respected me and my voice because he saw me work. And we had a great dialogue. And I had heard of him from Coach Carroll because he worked with him with the Jets. Um, and Brennan obviously had been around him a bunch, was on our team, Pete's son. Um, and, and Walt and I could always vibe. And then I felt at times he was a head coach that – uh, the personality that I got to fall in love with, it shifted to the quote unquote head coach personality. And that riff right there, um, I don't, I, I see a lot of coaches do it now in my current profession. Um, you know, you have to change, you know, when you're a coordinator to a head coach, like I get the natural shift in leadership skills, but I always wish for me. And again, this is just me at 21. I always wish the guy that I got to see in those meetings all the time, or the guy I'd work out with in the weight room, um, everybody got to see, and, I, and maybe they did in their own personal relationships maybe they didn't I don't know but I always felt like I had a real affinity for him in that regard um and then when he came up to the big picture and be the leader of of, of the program um he was the leader of the program versus the the more personable guy that that I got to meet in in those meetings I'm curious your, your take on that and if you could take us through your your dynamic I can I can, I can see that and I, I think um I think that's also another factor in why we were in Big East champs four years in a row and contending, you know, being a contender in the, in the BCS series back when it was there. Um, relationships, right? You, yeah. you took it upon yourself because there was something that you wanted that only he could give you. And you understood that. Back to my point of figuring out how things work and then work them. You worked your butt off. You went in there constantly not take a no for an answer. Uh, whatever he gave you feedback, you went, added that to your repertoire. I mean, I watched you, bro. I remember, I remember I watched you closely in your pursuit for this. So, but everyone else didn't do that. We had, a, you have 185 guys on scholarship. He didn't have 85 of those types of relationships with the guys. I think that's the difference for whatever reason, whether it's the player needing to make themselves available or he needing to work on that, leadership piece uh of his of his uh role as a head coach i don't think he could relate uh the way he probably needed to relate to to all of the guys especially key guys so i think that played a role in it i think he was a brilliant mind on the field uh i see him off the t i see him all the time now and we have a much better relationship now than we did uh when i was a player just because uh, just didn't connect all the time, you know. Sometimes, even if you're a hard coach, I mean, I've had shoot, I had both ourselves. Those are some hard, hard coaches, bro. Um, but I respected them and I understood what they were trying to do. I can't say the same 
for Coach Harris all the time. I didn't always understand uh, the why, you know what I mean? And maybe if he'd have found a way to communicate that and then maybe teach that, it might have helped. I don't know. I mean, like I said, I love the guy. He's a great person. Um, but I just think um, there were some elements there that was that were missing uh, just in totality as a, as a, as a head coach. It's just, it's just crucial to have, especially for – 18 to 22 year olds, right? Yeah. So, you know, and if you, and if we, and if you look at our roster across the spectrum, man, we had South Florida, you know, Jersey, PA, Cali, like we had a wide range of people. So you need a wide, you're, if you don't have it, somebody in your staff needs to have that, that it factor to relate to who, everybody so that we can all feel like this. Right. Because that roster that you're talking about, when we're like this, we're unstoppable. We smash Virginia, Virginia Tech. We smash people left and right. We win six games in a row after getting pounded, after being one and five the first half of the season. You know what I mean? Like, so consistency is key in all parts of building a team, not just the X's and O's. Yeah. I would say that. Yeah, so speaking of, let's talk about Vatek. Va- okay. I mean, you had the game winner. T- take, take people inside the helmet of, like, when – I mean, you played fullback. Yeah. I mean, some teams are bringing it back, like out here at least. Washington, Cal, Stanford's mm-hmm. had the position. Um, you know, SC doesn't anymore. It, it, it'll make his run. But when, when you get your number called to, to win a game, it doesn't happen very many times. Has that happened more than once in your career? No, nah, that was probably the only time. That was the one time that, that you always dream about it, like it's, like it's the movies, right, that you're going to cross the goal line and the crowd screaming. That literally happened to me one time when I was at Virginia Tech game. And the ironic part about that was earlier in that game, I had a very crucial fumble. I don't like to use that word fumble, but I, I did it. I own it. Probably I can count on one hand uh, how many times I put the ball on the ground since I was seven. But um, I did it that game, and it wasn't good. And I thought I was never going to see the ball again. And as we started marching towards the goal line on that last drive, I, I, it crossed my mind, but I know we got shoot number one out there, Larry Fitzgerald. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm expecting a fade or you know whatever, just throw it up. I'm expecting that eventually, but uh, with, with the time crunch and probably them game plan to him when we had you know, they had the Angelo Hall. I'm sure he had, Coach Harris had, you know, was playing the game of chess and he believed in me. I think he I think he knew that I I can get it done, and he probably knew that I took it really hard that I let my team down. And that if I got another chance, I was going to make it happen. So, um, despite there being some some blocking breakdowns and me getting hit, I was like, I'm getting in this damn end zone, like regardless. So, that's that's what I felt, and it was one of the best moments of my life. And I played in the Super Bowl, and it wasn't bigger than that. You know what I mean? Because it was my guys, man. Like you guys, like when you do something together with your brothers, like it's different than just. You know, just some guys that are out there for a paycheck. It's, it's, it just it is, is, you know. There's no way around it, so. Yeah. Wow. Okay, all right, so speaking of a Super Bowl, I, I know you get asked this all the time, but I'm super curious as a philosophy guy, um, how was Belichick? You know, everybody talks about, like, their process, right? You get the sign that you just showed us, you know, about loving the process. They, they have the Patriot way. Um, how, how was that f- for you? Um, and could you take us with what was it, if you could share it? No, I can share it because it's, this it's people always ask me that and they they're surprised with my answer. Um it's there's no crystal ball, it's no magic tricks, it's literally do your job and that's it. Now if he gives you multiple jobs, do all of them, right? A lot of guys wear multiple hats on the on the on the team and not just the players. There's coaches that are I know I know a guy that was a scout and he was a uh, part-time special teams coach like people wear multiple hats in that organization not just the players so that's just the mindset so do, do your job and um what I respect about uh Bill Belichick the most was not even the Super Bowl piece it was the night before the AFC championship I will never forget this uh, we we're playing against the Ravens um at home and you know you know how it is night before the game or typical meetings run through everything but once we got through, you know, our plays in the film, we sat there for like another hour, literally. And he went one by one to every single guy in that room 
and told us why we were here and what we were going to do, what type of impact we were going to have tomorrow night, the next night. And I was like, this is crazy. It wasn't scripted. It wasn't like he just, like he prepared for this and had like, oh, Lou, well, short yardage, you're going to do this. And da, da, da. No, 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 no. It wasn't that. It was coming from the heart and from his mind of he knew exactly what he expected out of his personnel that he put together. Like, and it was, it's like a, it's like a masterpiece, man. It's like a symphony. You know what I mean? Because he's able to, he knows what he needs out of you. If it's five plays, they better be the best five plays of your life. If it's 80 snaps, then I expect you, he expects 80 snaps, you know, full out, all out. So no matter where you fall on that, 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 that chart, he expects perfection wow. because you signed up to do your job, right? So, so what did he tell you as uh, Zane makes an appearance out of the pod? What's going on? Zane, you want to say? What's up, brother? Hi. How He's, you doing? Yeah, I've ever seen. Oh. Yeah. But could you hold punches? Yeah, I'll see. I'll hold punches. I'll see if his. I'll see if mom can do that. Hey, say goodbye, Lou. Good job. Bye. Yeah, it's a quick feat, man. I saw you in those drills too. All the drills you were doing. Hey, <laughs> the one we're doing of the pillows. Hey, how do you what do you catch with? Tell me. With your eyes. With your eyes. Yeah, your eyes. I remember that lesson. All right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Here you go, Mom. Bring that over. Thanks, buddy. All right. I love it. Get to meet the fam. A little That's heck yeah. No, for sure. That's, oh, can you, so what did he tell you? The question? Yeah. So oh, what did he say to you? Um, um, I mean, he, he was just very specific about my role because I got there late. I got there during the season, uh, towards the end of the season, and he was like, "Lou, you know exactly why we brought you here," um, and and he he just expected me to to execute, man. Like all my short yardage things, my my role was limited in certain spaces, but for this particular package, the the, the two back package. He expected perfection, man, and I tried to give it to him. I mean, I, to my recollection, I don't think I had – I don't think I had a, a, a mental error when I was there. I didn't have many anyway, but when you're there, you know everyone around you is, is balling at a high level. It, it's that much more pressure to to, to perform. And uh, just got, I got to add this, too. My first team meeting uh, in Foxborough, I sat there and watched Coach Belichick get after number 12 uh, for a while on the film session. And I was like, okay, this is real. You know what I mean? Like, and if, if, if Tom can get it, anybody can get it. So that makes you step your game up even that much more. And that's how it should be, right? I, I respect that. You know what I mean? And we all, and they all do. And those, especially the veterans that have been there and they have a fist full of rings, like they don't care how tough it is. They, they care about the end result. You know, I remember talking to, uh, Kevin Falk and, and just listening to him because I mean I had to catch up fast. You know I got there late and I sat with him a lot and just you know learned how to do things. So yeah, man, that was a that was an excellent, amazing time in my life. It was a short lived one one year, but it was um, it was critical and, and I learned a lot that year. You know, so I read an yeah. article about Tom Brady that I always give to quarterbacks where he said something like, "A quarterback has not." an extension of the coaching staff. He's an extension of the huddle to the coaching staff. And I thought that was just amazing. Um, yeah, man. What, what did you learn? I mean, very often, in life, very, not very often in life, do we get the opportunity to be around like people that are legitimately considered great at their craft? You, you've named some great ones mm. already in this conversation. What did you glean from him that you even use now in your career mentoring pit athletes? I mean, I think, I mean, I, I won't able to use him. I'm gonna. I'll, I'll list some of the guys that are Hall of Famers or future Hall of Famers that I just know, and they are the same up here. They're all the same. So Tom, uh, Jason Taylor, uh, Brian Erlacher, I mean Tony Gonzalez. Like I play with all these guys. I'm like, man, they're all the same, and it's just the mentality, man. Like Ricky Williams, you had him on your show um, a few months back. Like that's 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 my guy. But they're all the same up here. Um, and I don't know if you know what it's called, but it's just like you feel it when you're in their presence. You kind of just feel it, and you just you just kind of wanted to rub off on you. <laughs> you're yeah. trying to, you know what I mean? Like I don't even know what to call it, man. But it's just it's it's called it's it. 
it's, it's a hit factor and they're all they, they all have that same personality i mean they all work hard i mean it's talent of course that's 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 one element but there's something else man that i just don't know what it's called but they was those type of guys have it and they all it all oozes out of them like it's just as evident larry Fitzgerald is another one like they're all the same yeah you know so i, I did a film a couple of years ago called welcome to the it factory it's a high school mm-hmm. quarterback film uh, but we also went out and talked to the Russell Wilsons, Pete Carroll's, like uh, Ron Rivera's, like people that are around or have the it factor. And I'm like, I, I don't like using it as a broadcaster because it's like the most overused but undefinable phrase. And I think that's like the opening line to the to the film. But what we found through the study in the doc was if you have the it factor, when you walk into the room, people can feel you. Yes. But in addition to that, because people can feel – a bad egg too. We've been around enough cancers in the locker rooms. Like you could feel that too. And you're like, man, get this dude out of here. But right. they make everybody around them better is the back half of the definition that, that I would use. Walk in a room, they feel you and you make me better. And that elevation versus, Hey, I'm going to beat you or I'm better than you to me is like, like that's so palpable. You know, it's, it's the old quote, like a rising tide floats all boats or, if you look up the word compete on your phone right now, it would say to strive against, but the Latin root of it would say to strive together. Like those special ones, I always feel they have this unifying factor where you're just like, oh, Lou got here at 6.05 and the work at the 6.30 because he wanted to stretch. Like I felt that from you, right? And he stayed after an hour, an extra hour to stretch and warm down and do a little extra. I got that from you. And then we all of a sudden started to go every Friday, we'd go get like eggs at the little diner in, uh, yeah, man. in North Oakland. You yeah. Know, and that became like our thing every week. And the workout was from six to eight, but I wouldn't get home till like one o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, That's what it takes though, right? That's what it takes. Yeah. People don't see all that, man. They people the people that have like like the blinders on, they can only see the six to eight. Or this is one this is what expected of me, so I'm gonna do this. Great. I appreciate you doing what's expected of you. What about what you want and how would it be you really want to be great or are you just going through the motions and breaking down at the end of a uh, workout you know national champs do you really mean it or are you going to find something to get better at because i am a firm believer of you never stay the same you get better or you get worse it may not be drastically worse or drastically better but you get better or worse you never stay the same when you're working on your your craft no matter what it is not just sports so you definitely got to keep your mind sharp and, and, and finding things to, to add to your tool belt. I always talk about with the student athletes, um, just add, adding tools to your tool belt, man, because you never know what you're going to need. Um, and um, this has been awesome being back, man. I've been there for two years now. Uh, being able to use that platform and have that instant credibility because I've been where a lot of them want to go. It's been uh, it's been a blessing, man. I mean, I've been, it's been exciting, a great ride. I'm, unfortunately, I feel really bad for our seniors right now that are missing out on this trend, that transitional talk that we go through uh, in person. And we're still, you know, working on it, you know, virtually. But I really wish I could be, you know, sitting down at the desk one on one, just breaking them down and really getting them ready for that next step in life. Yeah. All right. So three more questions for you. I want I want to follow up on that. I would think that every player on our team back in the day, 2000 to 2003, every player felt as though, and I, I'll even include majority of walk-ons, everybody thought they were going to the league. On all the campuses I go to now, that has not changed. Everybody still thinks they're going to the league. So how do you, Lou, as somebody who sits down and has this talk, like what, what, what do you say to somebody that, look, anybody can make it. You just talked about Tom Brady. We know the documentary on him and how late he was picked. You, undrafted free agent. Me, former walk-on, didn't make it in the league, but you have your success story. What, how, do you, how do you guide the convo? So, and I'll ramble for another second. Everybody in the NFL says guys leave and they're broke, divorced, or on drugs. Yeah, but at least they had a little money. In college, I feel guys are already broke, right? They're, they may not be married, but they're probably out of a, a relationship. And they may be on antidepressants. They may be suicidal. They may be anxious, depressed. I mean, we've seen those numbers dramatically increase with the advent of social media. So, and oh, by the way, there's about 10 times more college athletes than our NFL players that retire every year. 
So that I don't feel as bad for the pros as I do for college kids. Right, so right, how, right. How do you talk to them when they're like, dude, I'm going to the league? And they might be like the nickel defender and get 25 snaps a game. It's simple, man. I, I don't believe in being a dream killer. So I simply uh, phrase it as this. Your education, you build a network, is not a backup plan. It's all part of the master plan. Mm. And it's built in. So whenever you stop playing, whether it's after your last bowl game or if it's 10 years after you play in the league, you still want to have your master plan in place because you're going to need it at some point. I don't have the answer of when you're going to need it. That's I just that's how that's how I, I deliver it. You know what I mean? Because you just you don't you never know. I mean, we understand the numbers and the, and the data of the probability of people making it, but man, you just never know who that one person that's going to throw off that outlier. Who that outlier is going to be? So, and I like I said, I'm not a dream killer. I'm not listen. If I if you're working your butt off, and who am I to say what you can or can't do or how you know what I mean? So. I simply say this, never, ever look at this as a backup plan. Uh, when we talk to recruits before they even get there, we're like, you don't, um, you don't think twice about high school graduation. You're going to graduate, right? So why wouldn't you think about that at the college level? Like, it's not a it's – not, it's, not it's, 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 it's built in. Like, it's expectation. That's why we don't talk about graduation rate. We talk about placement rate. Mm. That's the difference, right? We know a lot of people with degrees that are looking for jobs, right? No, no, no. When you leave out of here from Pitt, you're going to have a job. You're going to be placed in the in the space that you're looking to get to. We're going to make sure that happens. So awesome. that's that's, awesome. that's the message. That's that's kind of how you massage that. And then you know, um, you just allow them, just let life take over, man. Let's let it let life happen and let them learn the lessons that they need to learn. And even though uh, a lot of them have those aspirations, I'd rather them learn those tough lessons. The earlier you can learn that tough, that tough lesson, the better. It's, yeah. it's even worse, to your point, like when you get to the league and you have all this money, but you don't know what to do with it, right? And then you, and then you fall flat on your face and then you're, you're another, you're another you know, statistic. And it's like, it's sad. It's, it's extremely sad. Um, we're trying to prevent that too. So we have an elite student athlete department as well that I'm a part of um, that at Pitt where we work on that element as well, the, the whole agent process. Um, insurance, financial advisors, um, how to, you know, we don't pick them for you. We just screen them to make sure that at the very minimum, they don't have any, you know, warrants or anything crazy. Their all their certifications are up to date. Like they're, they're legit. Like we make sure, and then we just educate them on how to navigate that and how to budget and how to say no. You're going to have to tell your fourth cousin, sorry, bro, I can't, you know, fly you out and, you know, put you in the, the presidential suite. Sorry. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like those type of conversations. Like, so, you know, because cool. like you said, you know, you, uh, the same, the same group in our locker room wanted to go to the league and they're still 2020. They're still in that same mindset. So that's never going to change. Right. We need to change. The, the educators need to change the message, how to deliver the message needs to continue to evolve because um, the demographic changes, but you know, the messaging, has to has to be fit for them you know yeah that's so, so good okay so i i'd like you to look back now and reflect on your career a bit at we're both i think 38 39 similar 38 age. baby that's what i'm talking about yeah, yeah young young 38 look like you could still play probably um, I, ever. totally fair i feel like i could like i could run a few routes and play this lot i get down Ooh. But I, I could still play. I, I played in a Cal Spring game a couple of years ago. I got a, a little Are you sore. serious? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they wouldn't let me go live, but I did all the receiver individual pads on. Oh, my yeah. God. It was hilarious. Um, <laughs> but that being said, if you look back on your career now, I want to know the most catalytic moment and a memory that you think carries with you now. So what struck you when you were there and then what continues to shape your life now? You give your two, and then I'm going to give my two. And I totally didn't prepare you for that. So no, you didn't. But I'm, but I'm, I'm working through it though. I'm, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just gonna, it's gonna go for it, man. I think, um, I think my rookie year, 
and that's in Dallas with uh, Coach Parcells. I, I learned a lot. And remember earlier in our conversation, I talked about not making things personal or not taking them personal either way. Like, and I, and I, I learned in this, this lesson, um, long story short, he told me to go get a place. He said, hey, man, you're going to be here. Go get you a lease, get you, you know, an affordable apartment. You know what I mean? Congratulations. Like, you're going to, you're going to be here. So I went the same day, you know, found a spot, five minutes from the facility, signed the lease. The next morning, I get cut. I said, okay. And I took it and I, and I, and I made it personal. Now, knowing him, knowing him now, I know he didn't, it was out of his hands. But at that moment, when I'm 22 years old, I'm like, are you kidding me right now? Right. Like I thought a man's word was his bond. And he told me to do this, so I did it. And I'm I'm still in that mindset, like being coachable and you know following the guidance. And for that to happen, I mean, I, I had a I had a different chip on my shoulder, but I needed to develop that chip because even though we had this routine, right? We did everything the right way. We worked hard, did the extra time, extra film, ate right. We did all these things. It became a routine. Never confuse routine with commitment. Is what I learned, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Because even though, because even though I'm doing everything right, am I really like really ringing that thing out and getting the most out of it, or am I just checking it off the list? There's, mm-hmm. there's a difference. Um, so when I learned to add the extra chip and kind of have you know look over my shoulder at that level in the league, understand that now it can anything can happen to you. You can be fired at any moment. Once I learned that and understood that, I was like, you know what, I could do this. I just can't ever make it personal. Fast forward four years later, he brings, brings me to Miami because now he's in charge. He's a player personnel guy. Um, gets me a new contract. I mean, it came full circle. I went from hating this guy's guts for 24 hours <laughs> into him, you know, putting some money in my pocket and giving me the only contract I ever had. You know what I mean? Like a new deal. Like I've always was a, you know, just a year to year guy until I got to Miami when he took care of me. And we had a conversation about that moment as a rookie and in the why it happened and you know and, and those type of things. And I have a lot of respect for him. Um I haven't talked to him lately, but we still I still shoot him a text here and there just checking on him because that guy, I'm telling you what, he's he's changed a lot of lives in a lot of different ways. I went I went golfing with um L T last a year ago maybe. And we were uh, just talking about Bill, man. It was just like, even from like Lawrence Taylor back in the 80s to me in 2008, 9, and 10, like, it's the same dude, man. And all the guys in between. Think about all the guys he's touched in between. So just just learning about life. It was, that was a football example, but that was a, a life lesson that you can't make things personal. Um, and I still carry that with me. I, I do. You know what I mean? Even though – it may be a direct hit to your ego, to your soul, that you feel like it was a personal attack. It doesn't mean it really was. You just got to really separate the two. It's hard to do, but when you can master that, I mean, one of one of the best people at that, I, you already had him on your show, was Ricky Williams. He don't to take anything personal. He he is a he sees he has he's like Neo in the Matrix when he when the way he, the way he sees the world, like he he he, he can do anything he wants to do. Because he sees it that way, like he got a different lens than the rest of us. I'm telling you right now. You, you, I'm sure you've grasped it. Yeah, no, totally. That was that was pretty evident. <laughs> wow, that's a, that's such a great story. Um, I think for me, I think back. I have two moments that stick out for my career. One was uh, heading to training camp as a freshman because we had to bus over to the South Side, and I was with Johnny Terman who was our quarterback, yeah. fifth-year senior. And he, he reminds me of Lion, Matt Liner. Like, they just had this cool swagger to it. Maybe it's a West Coast thing. Yeah. And I said, hey, can you give me some advice? I was 18 years old, super wet behind the ears, green. I was in locker 106. Like, I didn't have a jerk. Like, I was cast-off guy. But I was there in the summer, so we had a relationship. And he said, Yogi, um, and I think it's because he was getting towards the end of his career. It's like, when you're done, like, they're not going to really – people aren't going to care about you as much, which I don't necessarily agree. And somebody like you wasn't there for us when we were there. We didn't have that department. Um, but he goes, get three business cards every day after practice on a Tuesday and a Wednesday when people are there. And I remember that. And every day 
my whole career on a Tuesday and Wednesday, I went and talked to as many people as I could. If there was one there, if there was three there. And it led to internships, relationships. When I came back a couple of weeks ago, the friendships that were forged, you know, all of that. And, and I tell that to freshmen all the time. And I didn't think of the long lens of it at 18, 19. I thought of like, hey, what's going to get me an internship in the summer or the spring? And they'd, it always worked. But those yeah. relationships was huge. So that was like the non-football. And the football one, the only picture I have of myself playing is uh, a picture against the University of Miami. Laying out. Thursday night. Thursday, Thursday night. night. It's crazy, right? Really fun. And the ball's like six inches past my fingers. And we're about to knock off the number one team in the world. And we're in South Beach. And the setup is insane. And former walk. Like the whole thing for me was amazing. And I don't you probably know this, but every Sunday, my whole career, Rod Rutherford and I would meet and we'd throw. And the last 12 throws would be game winning routes. And I would call it the schedule because I had it memorized. So it would be like Miami of Ohio week one. And then it'd be like Vatek or, you know, Miami or Boston College, whatever it was. And I would kind of play by play it. Rob lines out to the right. Five seconds left. It's third and eight. Rutherford throws it up. And I'd run a post drop and I'd catch it. So I can remember looking at him in the huddle and, and I gave him a look like, yo, Mo, like you're throwing me the ball. And he looked at me like, I know. And it was Larry and I, for those that don't remember, and I was on the outside. And I ran a post, and instead of getting lit up like I had been all game, I took, a, took it high over the – it was Sean Taylor at the time. The yeah. And Larry was at the sticks on fourth and eight, wide open. Conversion, keep the chains moving. And he throws me the post, and we don't make the play. We don't win the game. And that wore on me for a while because I was like, man, my hard work was supposed to pay off. Like I only believed in two things my whole life, which was good things happen to good people. Hard work always pays off. And it hadn't paid off. And I was like, what the hell? This is supposed to work. And the reason I have the photo up is that it's a reminder to me to not be a prisoner of the moment, but rather be a product of the process. And yeah, I didn't make the catch to win the game and like be revered in pit history. I didn't have that moment. But to me, it reminded me to, to not be attached to the end result of like, I still put in every second I could. I didn't miss a step. I have no regrets. I left it all on the grass. As Herm Edwards always says, is leave it on the grass. I left it on the grass. And and that always reminds me when I look at it of like, yeah, dude, like maybe I won't broadcast the perfect game or maybe I won't have the perfect, you know, conversation with our son when he gets in trouble or when I have a teachable moment. But like, at least I, I make the effort and I show up and, and it took me a while to get there. But I look at those two moments there, like one career wise and one totally personal um, that I pull from Pittsburgh and, and what that experience did for me. Can I add to that? Because. You you were spot on, man. But um, you were you were prepared, even though we didn't get the end result. You played that out every Sunday, and you were there. You were ready. You were prepared, bro. Not ready. You were prepared. That's the difference. There's a difference between being ready and prepared. You were prepared for that moment, and for whatever reason, it didn't happen. So I'm glad that you are uh, that you know, as adults, you know, we we got past that point. But I wish I would have known. Uh, how heavy it was on you, and I—I I definitely put my arm around you and told you, like, look, man, shoot, you—you you, you did it. You, you, laid, you laid it all out there, and there was there wasn't nothing else you could do about it. But that's what the game does, man. Yeah, the you're game right. does that to you, right? I mean, mm-hmm. that's just what it does, man. And it, it teaches you, and it hurts you. It's like that. It's like that hot girlfriend in high school that you know, you know, she's playing you, but you still want to give it a shot because you're just crossing your fingers, hoping she'll say yes. To the to the dance, like just that one time. So she always picks the older guy. She always picks the older guy with the totally, car, man. Totally, totally. He got the, totally. car, he got the money to go get some oh. eat afterwards. So, you know, Lou, look, man, I, I've taken up enough of your time, but I want to say, and you know this, like you have have had such a direct impact on so many people's lives, you know, and and me included in that. And I'm so happy that two weeks ago you looked me in the eye and you said, "Hey, I'm going to commit to catching up with you," and now we get to do it. And it's been a catalyst. I'm going to start calling more guys. I hope to do this little series, you know, not only in the time where we're quarantined in our homes, but also throughout the rest of my life. And I owe, again, the perfect fullback, great lead block. <laughs> Set it up, man. Thank you so much. Appreciate you, man. man I'm so proud of you and keep doing great things. You got a beautiful family. And uh, anything you need, man, you know, you know my number, man. So God bless. And until next time, bro.
Yeah, tell uh, your daughter Luna what's happening. We got to connect. I will. I'm about to break her down next time. We bring her <laughs> for a quick her and she, Zane. <laughs> yeah. She just woke up from. Her, I can hear her talking now. She just woke up from her nap, so uh, I would have brought her earlier, but you know. We'll catch up next time. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, tell the wife hello. I love you, man. As love you always, too, man. Hail the yes, pit. sir. All right, Have a good one. Hail the right. pit, baby. Peace.